Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. One of my favorite shows of all time is MASH. When I was growing up, my family and I would gather every week in the living room to watch the show. I would firmly plant myself down there in the middle of the living room floor in front of that big box of a TV that had the knob that you had to turn and was connected to the antenna outside and get ready to watch. To this day, it is one of my favorite memories of time that I spent with my dad. I remember the night we went to watch the final episode. I was 10, so I was going to get to stay up late because it was a two-hour episode. So I was really excited not only to see the finale, but also to stay up late. But now it's been 39 years since that show aired. And while I know that most of us probably have seen it, here's a quick recap of what happened. Everyone in the episode gets the incredible news that the war is ending. They dream of going home and of seeing their families and friends. They're excited to work in real hospitals with real resources. They can't wait to eat good food again and to feel safe in their daily lives. However, with this good news comes a realization. They realize that in order to have the good things on the other side of the war, they're going to have to leave some of the good things that have occurred during the war. They're going to have to leave behind their good relationships and friendships that they have made, that have supported and sustained them during this time. Ones that have come to define their lives. Now, one of the characters who struggles with this is B.J. Honeycutt. You may remember him. He is one of the main characters. He knows that this good news means that he gets to go home and see his wife and his daughter, Erin. But it also means he will leave behind his good friend, Hawkeye. And so while Hawkeye is naming all the things that he won't miss about the war, like baloney and dysentery, BJ tries to convince himself that it's all going to be okay, that they're going to send cards, they're going to fly from the East Coast to the West Coast to see each other, and he just can't muster up the courage to say goodbye. Over the past few weeks, I have tried to use Hawkeye's pattern of thinking to help convince myself that I am ready to move. I mean, honestly, I'm not going to miss the afternoon traffic on Highway 92 going into Woodstock. But that is about where my list ends. So I find myself feeling a little bit more like BJ, trying to convince myself and others that it will be fine, that we are Methodist and we know this is how it works, and that we'll keep up with one another. There's Facebook and Instagram and that there are all good things waiting for us into this, in this new season. Goodbye is a tough word. It means something is coming to an end. Things will never be exactly the same. And it brings with it a sense of loss and sometimes it's painful. 
Now, we've been saying goodbye for a couple of months now. We've known it's coming. Yet this week, I've struggled tremendously with how to approach it, with what to say, because there is a finality to it all. No matter how it is said on paper or out loud, the plans in motion will not stop. And while closing one season of ministry and moving into another one does not equate to a war ending, BJ's reluctance is something that I can resonate with. I think it's something we can all resonate with because our reluctance is rooted in the knowledge that through our connection to Christ and to one another, we have experienced something wonderful, a blessing of sorts. Paul's church letters to the churches often reflect this love that is known through connection. He greets people, he gives thanks for them and their ministry, and he offers encouragement to them. One of the places where we encounter this is in his letter to the church at Philippi. Beginning in the first chapter, verses 1 through 11, and then skipping over to the fourth chapter, I'm going to share a little bit of what he says. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God for every remembrance of you, always in every one of my prayers for all of you, praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And it is right for me to think this way about all of you because I hold you in my heart, for all of you are my partners in God's grace, both in my imprisonment and in defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the tender affection of Christ Jesus." And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what really matters, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. And then moving into the fourth chapter, he closes the letter this way, I've been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully satisfied now that, I have sent, now that I have received from Epidotus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a, six, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those in the emperor's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. When Paul writes these words, he's chained and in prison. And yet through his words, we hear him conveying a deep love for Christ and the people. He opens this letter with thanks and joy. He thanks the people for how they have been with him even when they are apart. He recognizes that they are connected through the service and through the work of the gospel. And we hear this right out of the gate when he addresses all the saints who are in Philippi. And he says, I thank God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. And then when he signs off, he gives thanks to the community for their gift, a gift that he points to as an offering of, to, of God or an offering to God, to the God who supplies all of our needs. Paul's thanks is not reserved for just a few. Instead, he thanks everyone all the saints at Philippi. Paul wants them to know that their identity is not in the world, but it is in Christ. And they, as a community, are a people set aside for the work of Christ. They are included in the faithful cloud of witnesses. 
Paul wants people to understand that saints are not only the ones who have gone before us, the ones who mentor us, who care for us, who love us into being, but the saints are also us. Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my favorite theologians, says it this way, the one thing that truly makes a saint is the love of God. Membership in the body of Christ, which is what all of us, living and dead, remembered and forgotten, great souls and small, have in common. The title of saint is one that has been given to us by virtue of our baptisms. And elsewhere, she responds to the question, what makes a saint this way? Extravagance, excessive love, flagrant mercy, radical affection, exorbitant charity, and moderate faith intemperate hope, and inordinate love. Saints are not saints because of any particular achievement. They are saints because they belong to Christ and they reflect Christ in their daily lives. And this is true for all the people of this congregation. Perfection is not what makes a saint. What makes a saint is opening ourselves to the way that God seeks to live in and through us. And together you are living into this call. You love well. Together you love each other, the community and the world beyond. You serve well. You use your unique gifts for the common good and you share Jesus with the world. And you give glory to God in all that you do. And it has been an honor and a privilege to participate in this work with you. And it is with thanks and joy that I pray that together you will continue to do the good work of Christ, the work that Christ has started in you. But Paul doesn't just talk about the saints as a group. He also makes it a little more personal. As he closes the letter, he shifts from that plural saints to the singular saint. He is grateful for each and every individual for what they bring to the table and how they share of themselves. And I echo this sentiment. I am grateful for each one of you. Like Paul, I will always give thanks for your connection to my life. We have loved, cared, and supported one another. We have grieved with one another. You have invited me into some of the most important moments of your families. We have laughed, we have cried and questioned together, and all of it has been a deep blessing. It has been a distinct honor that I will always cherish to have been called one of your pastors. More so, I pray that this congregation will continue to grow in their understanding of what it means to love. Paul says in verse nine that, that his prayer is for the people to grow in love. He wants them to know what God calls them to do, to determine what is best, what is right. And he prays for their future. And I'm going to do the same for you. I pray that this community of faith will not only remember from where it has come, but it will hold fast to the certainty that God still has work for it to do in this place. For if we continue to do the work to which we are called daily, we will remain connected. For each act of loving kindness is a small part of the larger purpose of God through the body of Christ. Whether it's weeding a garden, sharing a meal, handing out groceries, reading to a child, working for a more just world, or traveling to places near or far to share Christ's love, each act helps keep hope, love, joy, and peace alive in a world that does not always see it. And this is the work this church has and is doing to make Christ known in the world. But what future do we envision? Where do we encounter life? What is our hope for all of God's children? And will we allow the Holy Spirit to be our guide? 
I imagine that we hope for a future where there is daily bread for all. A place where relationships say everyone counts, that no one sits alone, and where peace and joy reign. A future that God helps us see when we stop and we rightly posture and humble ourselves before him in listening and in prayer. A future that not only says Jesus is our friend, but that says Jesus is our Lord. This is the future that we need to continue to walk into, just as we have done in the past. Let all that we do glorify God, for we are Christ's body, and glorifying God can take many shapes. We are called to be bold, imaginative, and innovative. We are called to sometimes work fast to meet a need, and sometimes to move at a snail's pace. God's time, it's not like our own. And no matter what shape it takes, take hold in Christ and hold on fast because it's all gonna be worth it. Earlier, I mentioned that final episode of MASH. And I invite you that if you've not seen it or you haven't seen it in a while to, to take some time and to watch it. And when you do, think of me. The title of that episode is Goodbye, Farewell, and Amen. The same title as this sermon. And the title says efficiently what I hope to have shared today. But for a moment, I want to comment on the words of this title, but in the reverse order. First, Amen. This is a word that we learn to say at the end of our prayers and our hymns. But what does it really mean? When I was a small child, I used to think it meant the end. We would say amen, and I would think, whew, the end. We're moving on to the next thing. But Paul uses it in this passage, and it implies truth. It means steadfastness, let it be, or let it become. Pastors often use it at the end of a sermon to say, let it be so, as a way of saying, let God's word become truth in this world. Jesus is referred to as our amen. He is the one who has known us from the beginning, who is with us today, and who holds the future in the palm of his hand. Next, farewell. Farewell. Farewell is a word that means may you travel well or may you fare well in your journey. The journey we are on is not one that we take alone. We walk in the company of God, our creator, as you have heard me say in countless benedictions. We walk with God, our creator, who is known to us through Jesus Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We walk in the company of the saints, the ones who have gone before us as well as the ones who are with us. And it is my hope that you will continue your journey together and that you indeed will fare well in it. And finally, goodbye. The Christian life is not about goodbyes. I say this a lot, particularly when helping people plan for end-of-life services. But it's about making room for the Spirit to fill and carry us on paths that fulfill God's vision for a more just and peace-filled world. It's about constantly moving forward in love to witness the ever-changing, ever-redeeming, ever-reforming, and ever-changing kingdom of God the ever reshaping kingdom of God that is being established for all of creation. And then it's about pushing past being comfortable to being Christ ever stretching hands, feet, arms, legs, heart and body to the world. To do what God intends for us to do we must open our eyes and ears to see and hear, to see and hear 
how change, no matter how difficult or painful it may be, is a way that God is doing a new thing. And it starts ironically when we look at the deeper meaning at the heart of the word goodbye. It is the shortened form of the words, God be with you. In the past, you would have used it as a send-off to a family member when they were traveling and you didn't know if you were going to see them again. It shared the hope that you had that God would be with them as they traveled into a future that was not quite known. And every now and then, a glimpse of this longer phrase glimmers through. In the past four years, I have glimpsed God be with you. You welcomed me, you trusted me, you cared for me, you cried with me, and you celebrated with me. And it is in these simple and powerful love-filled acts that God reminds us that he is indeed with us. They remind us that even when we're apart, we are still together. And serving this church has made me a better person, a better pastor, a better parent, a better spouse, a better friend, and a better disciple of Christ. In a few weeks, some of us may not ever see each other again on this side of heaven. But I do believe that through our time together, that God will forever connect and light our paths, the paths that we walk to continue to do the work of Christ in the world. So, goodbye, farewell, and amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.